Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny podcast. This is Stephen Spector. And as usual with me is uh, Rob Hirschfeld. Hey, Rob, how are you? Hey, Stephen. Good to talk with you. Good to talk again. And uh, as usual, we bring only the best guests. And uh, one of my uh, favorite guests that usually when I go to events, I always reach out to talk to is uh, Krishnan, who's the founder and chief research advisor of Risadot Research. And uh, welcome to the uh, call today. Uh, Krishnan. Oh, hi, Stephen. Uh, nice to join this call. Well, great. Well, before we get going, can you just give us a little quick overview of uh, what Rishadot Research is about so people get an idea of uh, what you're working on these days? Yeah, Rishadot Research is a boutique analyst firm focusing on emerging technologies. So we don't, uh, unlike the traditional analyst firm, we don't sort of try to talk about everything and anything in the field, but uh, we sort of like uh, focus on cl uh, cloud DevOps and other uh, cloud services that come into picture. So more or less like um, emerging technologies that help enterprises be like Uber or uh, be like Airbnb and sort of like uh, out innovate the competition. So on one side, we advise uh, uh, enterprise decision makers on their uh, modern enterprise strategy. On the other side, we advise uh, enterprise vendors on their product strategy and go-to-market strategy. Fantastic. So we have a couple topics that we want to go through with you, Krishnan, and I think we'll start, and people who've been listening to this podcast, we'd like to talk about edge computing a lot, and, and I think there's something, it's going to be really big, and, and I know uh, Rob has had a great quote from, Rob, who was that quote uh, that you put in a slide I saw recently about edge computing? It was going to be so much bigger than cloud. I can't remember it. None other than Michael Dell. Michael yes. Dell saying that Edge is going to be 100 times larger than the internet. So no, no uh, hyperbole on this one. I think he's he's dead on statistically accurate for that. So Krishnan, we're rolling out the red carpet with that lead. What are, what are your thoughts on Edge? And then it'll be interesting your viewpoint. And you know, obviously, we've been talking about it a lot. Yeah, I, I definitely see Edge taking a lot of getting a lot of traction in the next uh, few years. In fact, around uh, 2010, like I, I wrote a question paper uh, on P2P cloud being the next iteration of cloud computing. At that time, like I was not familiar with the edge, I was not familiar with the Internet of Things and all those things. But uh, we did see uh, mobile phone getting traction, so I thought like so much compute power is going to be in the hands of everybody. So why can't we rethink cloud itself from a more or less like a client server model where the uh, server is on the, the cloud with some cloud provider to a more decentralized model where uh, you can take advantage of computes that is spread everywhere. But uh, I think we have evolved from that day. Uh, it's a hard problem to solve first. So I think edge computing could be the first step towards the P2P model, model of cloud uh, where we could take advantage of computing at the edge to give better performance, better user experience, and possibly in some cases take advantage of the regulatory, uh, the, the need to meet regulatory compliance. So uh, Edge is going to be big. And uh, I, I did see an interesting use case Microsoft showed in their conference last year, or the, rather this year, uh, where the, they showcased that uh, showcased the cruise line having Azure stack on board, talking to uh, their Azure service. So I think that's one example of how Edge is going to pan out, but uh, I think there is tremendous potential uh, for Edge computing uh, going forward. And uh, we are going to see more and more offerings coming from various vendors to sort of solve, the, solve some of these needs. Uh, data gravity is going to be a problem. So Edge is a perfect uh, way to solve that problem or, or tackle the problem. Right, so that's that, that uh, cruise ship is sort of like the poster child use case for, yeah. for the Azure, Azure stack. Um, do you, I mean, one of the things that seems to define edge discussions is the, the fight of defining what the edge is. Um, do you want to take a crack at giving us a short definition of what edge, what edge means? Um, uh, that, that, that is still like something which I myself haven't come to a conclusion on. I would still see edge as something like uh, where you could push the you uh, push the uh, application closer to the end user 
to give a better user experience. That's so I see it at this point. But eventually, edge could come to mean uh, as we solve more of the distributed computing problems, edge could come to mean anything from uh, providing HA to other uh, traditional parameters. But at this point, I'm seeing edge as something that is focused on giving a better user experience to end user because you take the compute closer to where the user is rather than like uh, the user struggling over the internet. I, I like the way you're defining it. It's based on the user, a user need or a use case required yeah. driving you to, to edge being not cloud, right? Yeah. And and I, I like that. That that to me is my working definition for edge. It's a little bit frustrating for people because I like to define cloud as every as edge as everything that's not cloud, uh, <laughs> which which maybe sounds a little bit broad. But um, in the world we're moving to, right? Cloud seems to be sucking up all the oxygen, uh, but yet there's clearly use cases that don't fit the cloud. Yeah, I agree. Uh, do you, do you see specific problems as being ones, hard ones that are not well served for cloud? Like there, is there a set of sort of, you know, initial problem spaces that, that jump out to you? Oh, uh, definitely the uh, issues with networking is still a, pro uh, still a use case that's uh, showcased in that uh, cruise lane example of Microsoft. That is the first thing that jumps out to me. But I am thinking like as 5G becomes the norm, I think there will be a lo lot more opportunities that will pop up that we cannot, uh, think about today. Still, we are thinking about the problems from the traditional networking point of view. Once things like 5G becomes the way of life and the way uh, the tons of data that is being collected everywhere, I think there, there, there will be some really interesting use cases where you do the necessary data mining or even application of uh, ML and A algorithms at the edge and you can customize it to the end users and probably give better uh, uh, user experience that way. So it's still, I would still say it's early, early days, but uh, there's tremendous potential there. So the, the five, the 5G case, just to give it, give it a little bit of definition for people who don't, aren't necessarily tracking, 5G is going to be much smaller cell, cell footprints. So there's going to be a lot more small, small 5G towers with much faster bandwidth within that cell. So the, the idea is that you're going to have very data, you could have very data intensive applications, but there's going to be relatively short hops within that cell infrastructure. Is that, does that, did I capture that all right? Yeah, I think you got it, uh, got it right. right. But then that opens up all these interesting use cases for uh, car to car communication, Absolutely. in home communication, internet of things within a, a you know, a, a geo, um, right, that we, we're, we're creating new data Mm -hmm. um, you know, communication. Uh, uh, yeah, and also think of it like uh, even with the uh, uh, self-driving, uh, even assuming that we get, get into a world, ideal world of self-driving cars everywhere, um, you cannot uh, just apply the same standard to uh, different places. There is going to be local needs and uh, you need to have uh, better user experience for uh, users from different uh, regions or different uh, geographical locations. So uh, you cannot uh, uh, have the same processes everywhere, same uh, kind of compute uh, uh, compute models everywhere. You need to provide a local experience. I think that's where the edge is going to be uh, going right. to play a very important role. The the other thing that jumps out at me for edge, and I feel like it's not discussed very much, is this the the, the distributed scale nature of edge. Um, right, it's easy for us to think about like one data center, one car, one region, but the people managing these are, are talking about thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, right, I was uh, just at OpenStack, we're, we're talking to telcos, and you know, there's hundreds of thousands of cell phone towers, 5G is going to get even more uh, mm -hmm. extreme, and managing that sort of big edge of the infrastructure, it's, it's you know, it's a huge radius yeah. um, to cover from a management perspective. Do you, have you seen anybody talking about that side of it? Uh, there are a few startups talking a little bit, but they are still approaching the problem as if like it's a multi-cloud world. I think edge is much beyond just multi-cloud. So right. the, I, I think like uh, the, the, I have come across, 
any good management platform to solve those kind of use cases, but I think we will get there soon. So, I mean, do you think that multi-cloud, so I, actually I'm going to jump us a little bit to multi-cloud from that perspective, right? Because mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting, it's super hard. Do you see us making progress on the multi-cloud side? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm definitely seeing uh, progress on multi-cloud. In fact, uh, I even, uh, I, I gave a webinar uh, last few weeks back where I made a claim saying that multi-cloud is the foundation of modern enterprise. So I'm sort of looking at multi-cloud as the way you can retain the flexibility to innovate uh, rapidly. In fact, if you saw my tweets this morning, I was ranting on it. So everyone is associating agility with uh, speed, raw speed, and they are uh, talking about using just a single cloud provider to have, take care of your immediate needs. Uh, there is short-term thinking, in my opinion. Uh, the long-term thinking should be like uh, the, uh, retaining the flexibility to innovate rapidly. I think this is where multi-cloud becomes important. If I, if, I, if I want to innovate rapidly and compete with the likes of Uber and Airbnb in my domain, I would want to take advantage of the, so the different cloud, uh, cloud services that meets my needs. So I may want to run my web app in AWS, run my machine learning uh, workflows on Google Cloud. So I need that flexibility. If I don't retain that flexibility, then I will be in deep trouble. So, so would you, when you see multi-cloud, do you think that people are going to take a single application and jump it between multi-clouds or just that the companies are going to have multiple clouds in their IT spectrum? Uh, I'm seeing the latter, like I'm seeing people using okay. different uh, cloud providers based on the application needs. Of course, as, as you go into a microservices world, probably some of the microservices might be running in one cloud provider and some other on the other one, but I, I don't, uh, there, there are definitely some HA related, uh, related use cases there, but uh, that may not be cost effective in my opinion, but uh, Again, it depends on the needs of the customer, but uh, mostly I'm seeing the latter. So, but if I'm an IT department, my head just exploded because what you just said is we're going to have multiple infrastructure types to support. I mean, you, you could get a PhD at this point in Amazon cloud. It's so complex. There's so many parts. Um, just securing it is hard. Um, and, and so we're, we're saying that for good reasons, I think your reasons are legitimate. A, a company might build uh, expertise in, in Amazon and then turn around and for, for legitimate business reasons, spin up something in Google, which requires a whole nother infrastructure expertise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where does that stop? I mean, how, do, how does an IT department sustain, this isn't like Dell servers and HP servers, right? This is actually fundamental difference. There's some fundamental differences. There's different expertise required. Mm -hmm. um, how does a department it, cope. Yeah. It is a hard problem. Yeah, I think uh, so there are some startups trying to address that. Even Kubernetes and Bosch try to address some of the complexities. There is no one single platform that could solve all the issues. It's good. The, the problem is many fold in, uh, in this in the sense that there is a problem with the decision makers. They need to build a culture to support this kind of multi cloud scenario then operations are the ones who are going to face a lot more uh, headaches than uh, with a single cloud provider. They need to not only ensure uh, reduction in complexity, but also ensure governance and so many other things. So at the same time, provide a self-service option to their developers. And developers need to make sure that even while using a multi-cloud scenario like this, they don't get struck uh, with a single technology from a single provider. So that they, they cannot move uh, port their applications so easily to another cloud provider. There are so many things in play here. It's going to uh, take some time before people get some clarity there. So, but I think uh, that's where we are going, and uh, we need to. So it's a hard problem, but uh, there are advantages we need to take uh, face it. I, I see the advantages. I just every everybody who's tried to solve this with the least common denominator approach strikes me as as failing yeah because right we're not we're not able nobody wants the least common denominator approach between google amazon azure and whoever else is out there mm -hmm. um and a tool like terraform which we've become big fans of doesn't even pretend to create an abstraction mm -hmm. for for you know it's you can use one that same tool across all these clouds mm -hmm. but you can't use the same plan 
plans aren't portable at all because the the clouds are different enough. Do you do you see? Is that is that just the state of the art today? Um. Yeah. Yes. That's where it is at this point. But uh, the thing is, like, uh, there are uh, one or two uh, plat uh, platforms, operations related platforms that provide these single pane of glass kind of uh, visibility into the multiple cloud services. But still, like I see problems like uh, how do you take advantage? Let's say for my workload, I'm using in um, uh, AWS today, but I do see Google sort of offering me better cost advantage. So how do I move, uh, move the movement easily and ensure that nothing breaks? So there are so many problems there, which uh, I think uh, we'll be tackling over the next few years. But uh, uh, at this point, we are still at the stage where, hey, can you get a single pane of glass to see all the cloud services and give developers uh, not common set of features, but uh, least common set of features, but the, all the features from all these cloud providers and let them provision without having to learn uh, uh, how to use cloud formation or how to use ARM or whatever is on the Google right. side. So th these are the problems some, some of the vendors out there are trying to solve and it is going to take some more time before uh, it sort of uh, gets better. So, so from that perspective, Kubernetes, you know, creates a common sort of a platform that you can use to manage containers. You're still going to wire into the cloud specifics, right? Yeah. You still, you still need to deal with whatever's unique to that cloud. So how does, so, I, you know, I'm, I love Kubernetes. I'm, I'm, I'm deep into the thing. I'd love to, Take our multi-cloud and then frame it against Kubernetes, or where, where do you? How do you see those those two, you know, pieces intersecting? Um. Yeah. Yeah. I think Kubernetes lets you manage your application across multi-cloud in a seamless way, but uh, again, like um, not not across the, multiple clouds, but across like different. Lets you be multi. <laughs> this is where it gets confusing. Yeah. So are you saying you're not saying that Kubernetes lets you create a multi-cloud? No, no. That's that, that's what I'm trying to uh, explain, and I sort of got struck with that. Like, uh, it's it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. It's it is uh, Kubernetes helps you uh, manage your application with the multiple clouds. Let me put it that way. But but uh, still, like uh, there are other problems that needs to be tackled which Kubernetes at this point is not tackling or maybe with the vast ecosystem it has, we might get there, but. Uh, so like what would be, what would be one of those problems that you would say or a couple of those? Uh, let's say like, uh, for example, uh, AWS has so many uh, services, my applications are going to use, use them. How am I going to uh, use Kubernetes to manage my containers? While also like uh, while the, also wiring the applications encapsulated in these containers to various services right. from these cloud providers, that's a uh, big problem at this point. Like so, like, so, like if like relying on S3 or Dynamo or some data storage. Exactly. Yeah. Basically. So we need some kind of portable APIs. Like uh, how are we going to sort of reduce the complexity around that? So that's still a problem. Right. And there's the Kubernetes has that service broker. Uh, emerging service broker piece, which come, came from the Cloud Foundry group. Yeah, open service uh, uh, broker, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. In fact, I wrote a blog post uh, some days ago, uh, I think uh, two weeks back, about uh, what are the different scenarios emerging in, uh, in terms of abstraction that enables portability. One is at the platform level, other one is at the service uh, specification level, which is what you uh, talked about. Then there are portable APIs, which helps you sort of like talk to a single API, uh, the, yeah, there are J clouds and other things which only brings in common set of features. Then you yeah. have things like Minio, which takes uh, S3 as the standard and sort of goes deep, but enables that kind of a scenario on multiple cloud providers. So right. uh, there, there are multiple approaches emerging, and uh, I'm looking, uh, I'm waiting to see how ISVs are going to embrace open service uh, uh, broker uh, specifications and make it easy to port applications from one cloud to another. I'm still, it's still in early stages. There are some ISVs connected to PI, uh, Pivotal Partner Network who have embraced that, but I'm not seeing it across multiple providers. So I am still waiting to see how that is going to emerge. Okay. For, as, a, as a reference, uh, Brian Stevens and Aaron Delp do a, a, a pod CTL, pod cuddle 
uh, so mm -hmm. I would call it uh, podcast that talked. They went into depth about some of these pro uh, brokers, and I would I would encourage listeners to cross reference to that podcast. Uh, hear more about the, these these brokers. They spent an hour on it, so mm -hmm. <laughs> more than we're going to spend. But I, I think I think you're right. Right, it's it's going to come back to the ISVs. That's the that's the key question here. Um, is not necessarily does a individual person writing an app on Kubernetes spin things up? That's in a multi-cloud scenario. You are going to if you're writing an app, you're going to wire to the cloud that you're targeting. That's what yeah. I think that we, we're both we're both in violent agreement on this. Mm -hmm. The place where the the portability starts to matter much more is if I'm a software provider working in the Kubernetes ecosystem. Then I don't I, I can't afford to be wired into Amazon only. I need my my software to be multi cloud because I don't want to limit my TAM, exactly. my addressable market. Yeah. Um, where do you see the Kubernetes ecosystem is is moving right? With there's so so just framing right. Kubernetes has been uh, sort of winning the platform war in that uh, a lot of the competitive platforms. Uh, are now or the vendors have really uh, you know gone away from having their maintained container scheduling platform into having um, into having uh, basically using Kubernetes. What's, where's that going? Why? How? What's the next? What's what's that going to look like? That's an interesting question because uh, as someone like who was part of OpenShift team and uh, who was uh, part who was there when OpenShift embraced Kubernetes while pundits were talking about uh, Cloud Foundry becoming the standard. I feel happy that Kubernetes is uh, sort of winning the orchestration wars and becoming more or less like a standard. But I also want to war warn uh, the listeners about thinking that Kubernetes is going to be the st standard forever. Because uh, if you look at uh, circa 20, 14, 2015 time frame, Docker was emerging as that standard that is going to uh, cure all the uh, uh, enterprise IT problems. So now Kubernetes has uh, taken a much more uh, sophisticated approach to solving the problems, but still like, uh, I, I, I wouldn't say that Kubernetes is going to continue to be the standard going forward. Uh, the competition may not come from some other orchestra play, player in the orchestration plane, the competition might come from some other technology like serverless, which could make Kubernetes somewhat little less relevant than uh, what it is today. So I, I see serverless as a potential threat to Kubernetes ecosystem at this point. I, I don't see any other uh, orchestration provider by, uh, coming up and displacing Kubernetes. That way Kubernetes is going to stay the standard for the orchestration plane. but. Uh, Serverless could come and make Kubernetes less important, just like how Kubernetes took the gas out of Docker. So I think that could happen. It's an interesting idea. I, I've been assuming that serverless would emerge as a Kubernetes application. Um, that, right. I, so, I mean, you mentioned OpenShift. I think it's a great example. Um, the people using OpenShift don't worry that Kubernetes is the thing powering it. Right? Mm -hmm. Kubernetes is, you know, sort of on track to become an, a ubiquitous invisible platform you're going to buy things that that work with ci pipelines or with serverless functions or things like that that might be enabled by kubernetes as an ecosystem mm -hmm. do, do you think i mean and and that locks helps lock kubernetes in but at the end of the day do, do end users or developers really care if it's kubernetes behind the scenes or not developers don't care but again again like uh, we have to look at it from a totally different perspective. Like uh, if you look at the, if you just ask a developer, hey, do you care whether it's an under, underlying component as Kubernetes or the Docker is the encapsulation that's uh, encapsulating your app, they'll say, hey, I don't care. All I need is an API to it. I want to push my code. But if you uh, look at it from a CIO perspective, where the, uh, as a uh, leader, you want to retain the uh, flexibility to innovate rapidly, probably you want to uh, look at it from a different way. How, how do I ensure that I have that flexibility to innovate? So multi-cloud and Kubernetes becomes an important component in this kind of discussion, these kind of discussions. Then like uh, if you also look at it from the point of view of taking the compute to where data is, uh, serverless as it, uh, you see it in AWS Lambda or Google functions or Azure functions alone is not going to solve the problem. You need to 
have so, uh, some solution like uh, Kubernetes driving the serverless component on top. That's where serverless becoming an app to Kubernetes is a possibility. So uh, that is one scenario where Kubernetes will still be relevant, but uh, it may not matter to the developers, but it may matter to the organization to uh, to so, retain the uh, flexibility. So you're, you're making me think of something that, that might make everybody <laughs> scared. What you just described sounds a lot like the way Oracle used to sound. Oracle database infrastructure, mm -hmm. right? Uh, people didn't buy an application because it ran on Oracle. But if you were, an, if I was, a, you know, 10 years, 20 years ago, if I was selling an enterprise application and it didn't support Oracle as the database, then I couldn't sell into enterprise, right? I had to support Oracle as a database platform because everybody had bought it. It was standard. If I was going to manage databases, they were going to be in Oracle databases and managed by the DBAs, right? That was, you know, bringing, you know, I used to try and do this, bringing SQL Server or Postgres or MySQL into an organization that was on Oracle standard, uh, it was impossible, yeah. right? Does, does Kubernetes have a, a, a future like that where, you know, the developer maybe doesn't care that it's Kubernetes or not, but you show up at the enterprise doorstep and they do care because they're already managing that infrastructure? Absolutely. Uh, I do see, the, see a future where Kubernetes will be the, uh, something like Oracle that was 20 years back. Uh, especially the, right now, like uh, containers are the main thing for enterprises. Those serverless is just there up, up in the horizon for more, most of the decision makers and even developers in the enterprise. Containers are the key thing and Kubernetes is uh, entering enterprises with full speed. So uh, going forward, Kubernetes could be the way enterprises manage the not just their multi-cloud strategy, but also everything on top, whether it's serverless or uh, even uh, running services that are needed for their application. Probably Kubernetes could be the framework that covers everything. It's an interesting, John Willis, I just saw a podcast with him on the Cube, and he was uh, talking about people being container first, like be, the, the phase after cloud first is container mm -hmm. first speaks to what you're saying. It, it sounds like uh, you would agree, right? The, yeah, the, definitely. At this, point, that's what, yeah. Uh, at this point, container first is the uh, big, uh, big strategy shift for most of the enterprises I'm talking to. So they're building into containers, which then enables CI pipelines, it enables good practice. Do you see, do you see obvious places in the ecosystem that, that there are gaps though? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, container management and Kubernetes, Kubernetes is not complete. It's not yeah. enough. Um, are there particular areas that you're tracking as, you know, major commercial gaps or places where people doing Kubernetes need to look at uh, filling before they, before they jump in with both feet? Uh, I would say there are some areas around uh, messaging uh, where some of the organizations are still taking uh, traditional uh, messaging tools to sort of use it use along with Kubernetes that, that may work in the short term, but I think uh, especially taking it advantage, multi-cloud, multi-service future, uh, you may need to rethink that strategy a little bit. And I also want to see ISV is embracing something like open service broker uh, specification to make it easy to uh, uh, use multi-cloud strategy as the underlying foundation for my Kubernetes uh, the platform. So these are some areas where still like uh, the people are not confident, but I would uh, I would say we'll get there probably in the next year or so. Okay. Yeah, I would I would throw service mesh into uh, a service mesh into mm -hmm. a similar bucket, right? If you're buying a service mesh, would allow you to buy some components from a vendor and then wire it into your larger application. Yep. Um, so potentially from that perspective, ISVs would, could be selling you best of breed components. Mm -hmm. um, which actually brings me to another, another interesting point uh, to consider on our way, probably winding back towards edge. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it feels like we're in this best of breed world um, where there's no clear behemoth winner. You know, even mm -hmm. Amazon, which 
you know, is clearly emerging as, as a dominant infrastructure play for everybody is still not particularly wired together. It still feels best to breed, even if you're consuming everything from Amazon. Yep. Uh, I think uh, the point you made that you can do a PhD looking at Amazon Web Services is quite valuable. Yeah. yeah. But, but how to, I mean, that's best of, best of breed in IT is a, is, is a pendulum swing to me. Mm -hmm. um, I don't feel like we're swung all the way because people are very, very nervous about lock-in. They're very worried about pace of innovation. And so I heard somebody talking, um, I'm trying to remember the person so I can give him credit, but this was sort of a theme is that we're, we're not uh, one, you know, one thing. We're composing our infrastructure out of layers and layers and layers of pieces. Mm -hmm. um, this was a, as Jonathan Bryce made this point at the OpenStack um, keynote, uh, you know, that the problem is integration, right? Uh, do you see that changing? Do you see us going, you know, having a single vendor who can provide an integrated solution? Um, or, or is this going to be what IT looks like for the next uh, 10 years? Uh, I, I would say like, uh, I am uh, personally, I'm skewed towards the best of breed approach and uh, I'm ready to composable enterprise uh, approach promoted by Jonathan uh, uh, from when he was at Warner Music Group. So like I, I still see everything from infrastructure to higher order uh, services to be best of breed. And I will take a more composable approach with, along with automation to tackle some of the problems that comes with that. That is going to be the way it is for the, at least in the short term. I don't know how the long, -term's, uh, long, long term is going to emerge, but in, in the short term, uh, I would say, Confidently that for the next five years, definitely best of breed is going to be the path most organizations are going to take. It, it feels composable first, 100% agree on composability, right? I've been banging the composability drum for a long time, mm -hmm. uh, even from the earliest days of, of, of Crowbar work, mm -hmm. uh, let alone the latest digital rebar. Um, it's hard though. Um, yeah. it, it, but it feels like every year in IT, we go away from integrated solutions and, and more and more towards smaller and smaller units of work, which then drive us back to composability. Um, yeah, in fact, uh, I, I would say, I, I would even tie it to the, the theme I have been harping on that is retaining the flexibility to innovate. I think having this uh, uh, composable approach to every layer of your stack helps you retain that flexibility. Like, uh, I think technology is, uh, see in the past, technology was changing in a uh, linear fashion. So you could go with integrated, uh, you could buy an integrated solution, put it in and not worry about it for the next five years. But now the technology is changing uh, uh, very much more rapidly. In a moral, uh, moral, we are going towards an exponential kind of a uh, change. So what we need to do is retain that flexibility to innovate and to retain that flexibility to innovate we need to take a more composable layered approach to everything from infrastructure all the way to higher order services. It is, uh, it is a difficult problem, but I think that's the way you can retain your I totally, so it, to me, this composability and innovation go hand in hand. Um, yeah, yeah, and that's, you know, when we look at the number one problem our, our customers face in adopting product is that the things that they have to displace because we're not net new, we're going, a lot of times we're going into existing infrastructure. Mm -hmm. It is so hard for them to tear out uh, a 10 year old cobbler infrastructure because they've hardwired it into everything. The lack of APIs, the lack of composability um, have made it impossible for them to innovate in their own data center and they're stuck, right? They mm -hmm. can't do immutable infrastructure even though they want to. Um, you know, I guess when you know people evaluating technologies need to be looking at the composability of those layers. Absolutely, absolutely. So, In fact, I put it as the mantra for the modern enterprise. I, I, I uh, so yeah, it, it is a little provocative, but I, I say if you are a modern enterprise, want to keep on innovating at the speed of your business, you keep composability and uh, and a much more layered approach as a way to keep that edge. Otherwise, uh, you're going to be you're going to lose out in this uh, fast-changing uh, technology landscape. So that's that's a that that is a highlight for a CIO listening to this, or somebody trying to t convince their CIO 
not having composability is technical debt. So yep. going too fast and hardwiring things together and not paying attention to abstractions and keeping keeping things so that you can replace layers, um, it's 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 more expensive to do it that way. But it's going to keep you from being locked in next year, next month when something changes. So I want to take that back to edge because this to me is is where you know the the edge infrastructure side gets really interesting. It's going to be innovative. Mm -hmm. It's going to be fast. We don't know what it looks like, so so we have to be ready to innovate there. Um, so it's a different it's a different thing, right? It's it has to be composable. Has to be these smaller units. How do you, how do you think the cloud has has changed our perception of edge edge data centers or edge infrastructure in general? Um, I would say like uh, more than cloud as the underlying infrastructure. I would, I would say things like uh, DevOps and microservices, cloud as enabled, is helping us think about edge in a different way. Like uh, uh, once the some time back, if you go and talk to a developer saying that hey. You need to make your application much more uh, componentized, and you need to take a more uh, uh, microservices kind of an architecture. They are going to say, they would say no, that's not going to work for us. Now, like uh, almost every organization, uh, I've been talking to some of the really large uh, Fortune uh, 100 uh, kind of organizations. They are looking at microservices as the way to retain their uh, their edge. So, like uh, since this mind shift has been has been happening. I think the way people look at edge is going to be different from the way people do, people would have looked at edge computing if they are still stuck in that uh, traditional old-fashioned processes and uh, monolithic architecture. I think uh, now people are uh, people will be thinking in a much more different way, and that will lead to edge being uh, the critical component of innovation going forward. So it's edge isn't just hyper-converged infrastructure servers stuck on the edge. You're you're, you're saying. It's microservices. It's going to be much more container friendly from that perspective. It's going to be much more dynamic. Absolutely, um, absolutely. So I, I look at as I said, like I look at the edge as delivering better user experience to my end customers. So if that is the case, like uh, I'm not looking at it as an hyper hyper converged uh, solution delivering some. Uh, or uh, some some kind of uh, thing that my user, which may or may not help users. So I want to target my users with the right set of services so that they uh, they get value out of it, and I I get uh, I get to solve my customer problems much rapidly. So that that's how I'm looking at uh, the evolution of edge. Right, but those a lot of, to me a lot of those services you're describing, it you know it's almost like we put them wherever they need to get put. Mm -hmm. Right, you might start them in in a cloud infrastructure, and then if the if the APIs are if the service level is do, is not where it needs to be, you would then drop it into a local infrastructure or a closer closer to the customer infrastructure. Um, but yeah, it's not I, clear, it's, right? It's 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 going to be a moving target from that perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It will be like I, I, I would look at uh, the uh, the future of IT to be more fluid that fluid that way. The thing is, I, I, I won't be just taking the all my apps from the cloud infrastructure and move it to edge. Rather, I would rather take the set of services that are needed to move to that particular geographical location or for the uh, to so, solve the uh, customer problems in that particular uh, geographical location and move there. That's where the microservices architecture becomes more important to me. So I see everything from containers to DevOps to microservices hand in hand for the for any modern enterprise. And that's where the way you look at edge is not an extra hardware extension of your centralized cloud, but rather I see it as edge as a more loosely coupled set of infrastructure components that is serving a particular customer problem in that particular geography. Does it make sense? So more cloud-like. There's there's yeah. a lot of cloud elements, although management, distribution, um, you know, the the how how we're actually dealing with that infrastructure is is going to be different. It's it's really a conundrum. We've yeah. got you know this highly distributed, very controlled environment where we 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 need to be able to you know run infrastructure in this in this managed way, and yet what you're describing from an application perspective 
feels much more cloud-like, right? Mm -hmm. Kubernetes, microservices, lambdas. Absolutely. Um, wow. So it's 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 not cloud, and it is cloud at the same time. Yeah. I, I think yeah. that's a that's a good way to think about it. Yeah. Um, I think I think Krishnan's the most cloudy of cloud. Yeah, I haven't been <laughs> His edge is more cloudy <laughs> than other edges. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely a new way to new new way to think about it. yeah the the idea of it just being an embedded device talking to the internet um, from what you're describing it's not it's not that it's you know it's it's a it's a distributed compute environment yeah exactly but with the That's, same components that we're building everywhere yep that's why I started with my, the old article of my P two P cloud like uh, which I wrote in I think circa twenty eleven. So uh, I, I am visualizing edge more or less like that. At that time, I wrote that article talking about individuals, compute device, uh, mobile devices. But uh, the way I'm looking at it right now is uh, in terms of edge computing. So it's a more fluid, uh, loosely coupled set of infrastructure that uh, solves my global organization's problem based on the local needs. So does it explain what I'm trying to convey? I, I like I like the way you're describing it because it, it's focused on the applications, the users, the development processes that are going to go on, and then it throws back the management of that infrastructure. You know, that's that's very open territory. Yeah. Um, and that's how it feels to me, also. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, I, I suspect you're giving me the dirty look from carrying on a conversation a little bit too long again. So. No, that's that that's okay. I I like that Krishna gave us a different perspective. My only thought, Christian, on is this is all way more complicated than just writing C in an Emacs browser, <laughs> an Emacs window. Uh, I, 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 I tend to think in the simplification of things, we're overcomplicating things, but perhaps that's a discussion for another day. But uh, Krishnan, again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if people want to reach out to you, reach out to Rishidat Research. Krishnan, what should they do? Yeah, they can uh, contact at Rishi dot on Twitter or info at Rishi dot dot com is the email, and uh, they can contact me at Krishnan on Twitter, Krishnan at uh, Rishi dot dot com is my email. And then I would also encourage, you know, Krishnan's great. I know when I go to events, I try to find people to meet with, um, and Krishnan's always high up on my list, and he seems to attend everything. So uh, you know, if you're going somewhere, definitely reach out and and just spend a little time with Krishnan. Well, thanks again, uh, Rob and Krishnan, for a great podcast. And to our listeners, uh, we look forward to you joining us in our uh, next week's uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Krishnan, thank you.